time with some of my kin people. <laughs> it's been awesome. <laughs> Ain't nothing like family. <laughs> In every family, you got all kinds, but I'm so thankful. As I looked around, I said, well, you know, sometimes we argue about our kids and say the kids are bad, but we are part of that mess and they're part of us. And so, and I'm so thankful to God that he allowed us once again to do that. My famous word to all of my family is stay young as long as you can and get old only when you have to. Because once you get old, you're there for a while. <laughs> well, you hope you're there for a while. Because <laughs> you can't go back. You can drink Pepsi and think young all you want, but you'll still be old. Pepsi is not going to help you. But I'm so thankful that God has been so good to us. And I was sitting there listening to that song. And when I was singing this song, see, I was thinking about really exalting him. But you know, most of the time we can't exalt him, see, because we have exalted other things. And whatever the thing, when we exalt him, he has to be above every. Thing. It's hard for you to exalt him and still exalt your troubles. And most of the time when we talk to people, we don't talk to them about Jesus. We exalt our troubles and then at the end of the situation, but Jesus will take care of it. But we spend a whole hour exalting all of our dilemmas, all of our problems. I, I, I really believe that all things, I mean all things, work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to their, his purpose. His purpose. Because if we're not called according to his purpose, then we may not have all the good things working for us. But I'm thankful that God is so merciful and good to all of us, and I think sometimes we don't recognize God when we see him. We have a great eye for the devil, but we don't have a good eye for God. And it's hard to see him sometimes because of how we are looking at things. I remember Jesus said one time, he came to some people and they were talking about how well they served God. And then Jesus broke it down and said, you know, when I was in prison, you didn't, you didn't even come visit me? When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. And after a while, he said, uh, the people always say, well, well, when did we see you like that? When did you see God like that? He said, uh, well, when you did it to the least of them, that was me. <laughs> but isn't it funny how we miss God every day in our life because there's people all around us all the time. It's in dire straits. But because they're in dire straits, we will not lend a hand and not knowing that maybe the hand we lend was the hand of God to them because he works through you. Most people want God to come down and just strike somebody dead, but what God does, he works through you. A lot of times we want to see people change, but guess what? He works through you. And it's very important that we keep that in mind that when you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you didn't just do it to him. You did it unto God. When we begin to realize our rewarder is not the world. The world owes you nothing. Your reward comes from God. He really don't owe you anything, but he willingly and freely wants to give you all things. And if we only could understand where our rewards come from and who is the rewarder, and we would begin to realize that this is a walk of faith, and man, we want to get our faith rewards. <laughs> because if it's not of faith, it's not of God. Matter of fact, said anything that's not of faith is sin. So we have to be real careful 
as we walk this journey and realize, you know, sometimes just sitting down with people, I learn a lot. I learn a whole lot just sitting down. I learn where people are and I learn where mentalities are and the wave of, see, I'm, I'm not modern. I don't even have a smartphone. I don't know what's smart or not. It don't do nothing unless I tell it, though. And so I don't know about all the technology and all this. And I was, and my little granddaughter, I, I don't know, they on some beauty pageant and doing all their hair. Come on, Grandpa, let's take a TikTok or something. I'm talking about it, man. All the thing I know is Tic Tac. Uh, yeah, all that kind of stuff. They, TikTok. And they, they going on all this stuff behind me. I'm, what am I supposed to do? God help us. <laughs> I'm so happy about Jesus, though. Forget about all that other stuff. Praise God. We, we will, uh, I, be, I believe in exalting him. Because you're right. He is alone. My car problems is not worthy to be exalted. My house problems is not worthy to be exalted. My feelings are not worthy to be exalted above him. When you come to him, you got to forget all that. Don't come talking about, well, I know Jesus is here, but look at what I'm going through. Forget that. Don't exalt your going through. Exalt the one who's going to carry you through. Exalt him that will see you through. Don't exalt your problem. People, everybody's got a problem. A man is born a woman, he's got a few days, and he ain't got nothing but troubles. Don't feel like you're unique. God knew you had him when you came. But now he said, exalt me above all of that and see what I do. You already see what your problems have done. Man, I was dealing with my own people. Man, my head was started hurting the other day because when you deal with people, you get headaches. If you ain't careful, they get all down in your system. And my God, now you got them on your mind and you can't get God on your mind. You know what people are going to be doing when you're gone? The same thing they're doing right now. They just find somebody else to get on their nerves. Well, that's not my message anyway. God bless you. Appreciate you. Love you. I love God more than anything. And I don't know how much love that is, though. I can't really put a finger on it. Only time I know how much I love God is when I'm being tested. Loving God will help you make good decisions. Sometimes even decisions against yourself. Because loving him don't always mean you get the best of the deal. It means that he gets the best of the deal. And we have to realize sometimes, sometimes when we think we're not loved by God, it's when we've been loved the most. Because I found out that that's some, a price for love. It costs him everything to love you. And I know we say, I give anything for him. Well, is that true? It costs him everything to love you. But I'm not sure we're always willing to give all to love him. I'm not talking, talking next. I'm talking about myself. Can I love him like he loves me? Romans chapter 2, verse 11. Praise God. You know, I, I love sitting around talking. You learn a lot through conversating. That's the reason why I love talking to God, and I love him talking to me. You know why? There's a lot to be gathered in a conversation. You'll know more in a conversation. See, there's one thing that you can't do when you come to God. See, sometimes we want to impress people with the faith that we think we got, and we'll tell people about this, you know, and all that. But see, when you come to God, you can't come with the fake faith. You've got to come with the real deal. 
You, you, he already knows when you show up whether or not you really believe what you're showing up for. He already knows. He, I can't fool him. Now, in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to let you be seated. It's, it's kind of born out of conversation, you know what I'm saying? For there is no respect of persons with God. How many of y'all really believe that? Don't, don't raise your hand. Because I don't want you to say amen to something that you don't want it to be. Sometimes we say amen because it is right, but we don't want it to be right with us. So be careful what you say amen to. A lot of times they preach is preaching and you'll say amen. Well, when you're saying amen, you've got to understand what it means. It means so be it. So we've got to realize that now, do we really believe that God is no Respecter of persons. I didn't get no amens. I'm glad you didn't say that this time. Because you might be the first candidate to find out the truth. And sometimes the truth is not what we like. It's not always good. It can be very devastating. Truth can hurt you. Truth can kill you. Truth can kill you. Many have died with truth. But I believe that God has made a tremendous statement. But I need to realize how that works in my life and your life. Because I, I compare myself to Sister Booker, and I don't think God is fair. She got five cars in her yard, and I got two. One broke down. And that ain't fair. But I don't believe that God, when he talks about being a respectable person, I don't think that scripture has anything to do with her having five and not having two. I don't think that that has anything to do Brother Thornton making hundred thousand dollars a year, and I'm making twenty. So when we hear these scriptures and read them, we need to apply them rightly, because I think sometimes in church settings we have made people feel less than people because we try to show God being a respecter of persons. Because the Bible said that when it rains, you're not going to believe this. And so the book of don't get no more rain in her yard than I get in mine. And when tornadoes come, they hit her houses like they hit my house. Even sickness come. Even if I am eating vitamins every day, I still get sick. Precious God, I thank you and praise you for this moment. And as we minister to thy people today, I pray, God, for revelation and wisdom. Speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's so many things that God would say in his word that seem so contrary to the reality of what we're living or thinking. I've known many who have tried to dissect the word of God down to his, the dot in the I and the crossing of the T. And as they dissect it, they come away thinking, I see what God says. But see, everything that God speaks rests upon foundations of truth. A lot of things that we growl without knowing where it is settled. We want things from God that 
we don't really have the foundation to build on. There's so many things in God that it didn't just happen. You don't want to read the Bible. We don't read the in between the times and the lines. And, and we look up and, you know, we got guys doing tremendous things without realizing that there was something before that happened. And generally what happened is that you have a pretest before a real test. And a lot of times it's that we fail in the pretest, but we still want to act like we passed the real test. You know, I, I used to be real good at taking tests because I knew that if you could get a pretest before the real test, you knew what was going to be on the real test. And you were better prepared to take the real test because you already had that pretest. Well, many of us today, we think that God just casts us into the fire without a pretest. I believe that long before your troubles come, long before they get escalated to, to atomic uh, size, God has sent you or allowed you to have some pretest to see how you're going to handle some of the things going to be in your real test. And most of the time we forget where God has already been in our life when we get into what we think is a new place. And it's not really a new place. It's just a place that you was coming. He's been preparing you for all the time. There's no such thing as God being surprised. The only people in this surprise is us. But God is never surprised. He's never surprised if you woke up you know, my sons was down south, and somebody set the, the trail on fire. Now, they're surprised, <laughs> but God is not. You may wake up tomorrow, have a heart attack. You're going to be surprised, but God is not. And a lot of things that he sends us through early is to prepare you for the things that come later. And so there is, there seem to be, my granddaughter mentioned yesterday, just out of the blue, she said, Grandpa, you know life just ain't fair. How many of y'all really believe that? Don't say nothing. How many of you ever thought that? Underneath you, somewhere, you were always thinking somehow, I'm not getting the breaks that everybody gets. I don't live in houses like everybody lives. I don't drive cars like everybody drives. I don't have the clothes like everybody. And life is so unfair. And that seemed to be echoing even more so in this generation because, man, I swear I've never seen some pe people grappling and killing themselves and doing all kind of stuff just to try to keep up with somebody else. They made their life miserable, trying to make life fair. Say, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Homes are destroyed because somebody in the house ain't making enough to do what the other neighbors are doing. And so they fight. But you see, I believe that God is fair. He gives the fairest deals you'll ever get in your life. And, and it doesn't matter who you are, what God has to offer is fair. To whomsoever will, let him come. Don't matter who they are, to whomsoever will, let him come. And drink freely from the tree of life. You can't get any fairer than that. But what happens is that that fairness is not always taken advantage of. They don't have more of God because they have more money. You're not going to have more of God because you've got more of whatever. 
It's going to be because you fairly went and drank freely from what God has already offered. And he don't tell you to bring a teacup. He don't tell you to bring a big drink as much as you want. Take as much of Jesus as you can stand. You can't get any fairer than that. God does not withhold himself. He doesn't turn a deaf ear to you. To If you call upon him, it doesn't matter whether you got money or no money, live in a hut or mansion. If you call on him, he'll be there. Oh, hallelujah. You see, sometimes we think reading the Bible, that maybe we was born wrong, had the wrong parents. <laughs> I remember as a kid, I used to think that too, though. It's almost getting mad. Why in the world let me be born in this broke family? <laughs> I know you didn't. I know you didn't. Y'all was happy. Y'all had that silver spoon. I didn't have that. And I was wondering why, how come we got to be sharecroppers? I couldn't my dad been a captain in the army or something. You see, we want to associate with the people of the Bible. We want to associate with them, make some kind of association or some kind of connection. You know, we sing songs, we sing that song, you know, about dancing like David danced. But we don't know, you know, what caused the dance. And see, it's almost impossible to dance a dance that you don't even know what caused it. There's a reason why he danced like he danced, but why are you dancing like you dancing? I want to shout like him. You, you can. But most people don't want what gave him to shout. He didn't, he wouldn't just decide it was Sunday, I'm going to shout. His shout was born out of some things. Your praise ought to be born out of some stuff. Because if you're not careful, we make it way so common that it doesn't have substance to it. What I pray to God is God would do something good to us where that we could shout from the goodness of God. And then have it so that you shout it from his goodness and people will turn around and wonder, what's wrong? Because that is so out of order. But you are shouting because of something before you shout it. Oh, hallelujah. Sing, you know, sing like David, dance like David, shout like David. You don't have episodes in life to give you a song yet. <laughs> and a lot of times your song is just because you thought you sounded good, but you haven't had an episode to birth the song that you're singing. Oh, hallelujah. See, th th this, this is where he learned to sing. He didn't go to the piano lesson or, or, the, or the solo teacher to learn how to hit the A's and the E's. He learned how to sing when he was out killing bears and killing, and killing lambs. And that's when he learned how to sing. Because most people in trouble ain't singing, they're crying. And it might be that's the time when God is giving you your greatest song. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. There is, there is crosses that to be involved in our life, as well as crowns. But we should never get them twisted and never get it back, backwards. Sometimes we want all crowns and no crosses. Sometimes we think that, man, I'm claiming my crown. You ain't got to claim it if it's yours. It's yours anyway. You ain't going to believe this. He claimed it for you, but you just haven't got there yet. There's a whole lot of things Jesus already made a claim for you, but you have not got in the position to receive that yet. When you had a chance to get a new song, 
you complain. When you had a chance even to shout and praise God, when things came, you should have been shouting then. We got to quit trying to shout victories and then we ain't never seen war. That's a different victory shout when you know you got victory. It's going to be, you know, we, we want to be healed without ever being sick. I hear people all the time, you know, pray God uh, kill the COVID. He's not going to kill the COVID disease. It's here. Get over it. It's here. Oh, I pray nobody gets it. Well, they're getting it. So you can be sure they ain't heard your prayer. Because you know what this thing has become? A circus. No, it's personal. I plead his blood over my life. I ask to protect my kids. But you know what? They got to plead the same thing. He died for me. And guess who else he died for? He died for them. We need to be telling them. Instead of sitting around sucking thumbs and, and crying, it's time to tell them. Jesus died for you too. And he's still a healer. I don't care what nobody say. You don't fear sickness. You ain't got to fear it. I got a word before sickness came that there's a God that healed all my. And I just camp out on that. Oh, bro, you get sick. I've been sick, been sick. I've been sick this week. I'm still here, though. It's just a test. You see, we, we want deliverance. without recognizing our bondage. What's got you bound? It's hard to be delivered if you don't know what you're bound by. We, we want a, a Lamborghini before we get a Volkswagen. <laughs> oh, God help us. Nobody wants to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. We want to be like our kids, show up grown and without a job. I never see, well, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm glad y'all family ain't like that, but boy, boy, I, I got something in my family. I ain't lying, boy. They want everything. They want everything. I ask me, did you have a job? No. Well, what's wrong? If, if you can get on here and prep your hair and all that stuff, you ain't got no job. You need to get a job. Look, granddaughter called me and said, hey, my birthday coming. I want to get my hair done. Now, uh, what does that have to do with me? I said, I'm not going to even see you on your birthday. Take a snappy right now, one of them snapshots, and send it to me so I can see you now. That's good. Can I tell you, I really don't care if she get her hair done or not. I know you said, bro, well, that's so cold. No, it ain't. No. Don't ask me for a gift and then tell me what you want. It's a gift. You know why many of y'all suffering today? Y'all haven't recognized the gift. You will accept anything from God but the gift he gave you to accept. Everything God gives you, it is a gift. You can't go and tell God, oh, I don't want that much of it. It's a gift. Sometimes you say, well, I don't know. I, God, I don't want too much love because I might, I might be loving too many people and they take advantage of me. Do you know that no matter how they try to take advantage of his love, they can't? Do 
Do you know the only love to be taken advantage of is human love, and that ain't love? That's why we feel so bad when we think our love has been destroyed. We, man, I thought they loved me. Get that out your mind. If they don't know, love God, they don't know God, I'm talking about really know him, then ain't no way they're going to be able to love you like that. Eventually, you're going to have some breakdowns. But when they love God, as long as you, they're loving God and you're loving God, you're not going to have a whole lot of problems. See, sometimes we think God's going to let us go through this life and ain't nothing ever going to happen. And I don't, I don't care how well you part your hair and tell me how many times you read the Bible every morning. Let me just be honest with you. Sooner or later, if you are a child of God, something will come your way. Oh, I try to keep myself right so I won't have to go through nothing. You can't be right enough for that one. Because huh? it rains on the just and the unjust. So you're not going to escape. Because you're trying to escape some things, probably you're escaping, trying to escape God. Because he has things prepared for you to get you where he's trying to take you. And without you doing that, you'll never get to where he's trying to take you. You'll never know the things that God has freely given you without being available for God to put you through some stuff to so he can show you how great he really is. Oh, hallelujah. You know, I don't think that God is angry. I don't think that God is trying to treat you unfairly. Because if he answered the kind of prayers that we pray, he would have to apologize to people that came before us. Because they'd be wondering why in the world did you let them slide without ever a headache and here we've done everything and we got this. That's why you got to know that all things are working together. Man, we got to learn how to take everything in, in, in stride and realize all things are working together for the good to them that love God and are the call to call. All these things are working together for you. Oh, hallelujah. See, there's a pattern in the Bible, and sometimes in our selfishness. Because if there ever was a trap, the enemy put people in. It's called the selfish trap. That's, a, that's the one that messes up every time. Get to thinking, I can't believe this happened to me. You would think there was a president. What makes you think that it couldn't happen to you? Was you born on earth? You were born here on earth? And you said, what? It couldn't happen to you? The only way I would exclude you from being earthly is if you told me you was born on Mars and you came here and stuff started happening to you. I would say, I don't know why that's happening to you. But as long as you're here on earth, anything is possible to you, against you. But then the Bible said, but if God be for you, he's going to be more. So when you start thinking the unfairness of that, what's against you? Because most people can tell you what's against them. They can tell you what they're fighting against and what's fighting against them. They can come down and have a whole list of things. This is against me, this is against me. Well, forget about what you thought was against you. I'm not looking at what's against me. You know what's for me, though? You know who is for me? And you, do you know who's for you? And I wouldn't care if the whole world came out against you. You know what I'm going to keep looking at? I'm going to keep looking at Jesus. He's the author 
He's a finisher of our faith. And I don't care what the world brings. Somebody say, well, boy, I don't know. I hope this don't be. I don't care who the president become this next term and the term after that. I, I hope he's a good man. But if he ain't a good man, guess who he is? The one that's for you is greater than any man you're going to vote for you. You got to realize who we are. Jesus is real. He needs people to be real with him. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. And so we want God to, how many of y'all want God to love you? I know, don't be, don't be scared. Don't just hold your hand down. Don't let nobody, don't let your enemy know this, you know. Because some people are going to come and say, boy, I told God I want to love him today, and the devil just whooped me bad when I love him. No, hold your hand down. Don't say nothing. He can't read your mind. He just read you where you're acting right now. I don't want you to get yourself in trouble. Because sometimes you know how it is. It's easy when you go to church and they tell you, claim the victory. And you claim the victory and you go outside and get slaughtered. You ever done that? You get in them hyped up services where they got you going and reveal it to me. I'm bringing it down. Your kingdom coming down. And no sooner you leave, there's a resurrection. You ever seen that? Man, I tell you what, I, I've, I've been in those situations where, man, I, you, you got in the group and, man, the, the crowd frenzy got you all worked up. And next thing you know, you're shouting and dancing on a victory. And you, I know I got it now. And then you go outside and the victory you said you stomped in the church is waiting on you. I mean, what happened? What, what happened caused that? Well, who did that? I know I got the victory. Only way you're going to ever know that you got victory, you got to know the one who gave it to you. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know victory. You got to know him to know victory. Because when you look at him, no matter what comes, you got to keep looking at him and realize my victory is not in what I'm looking at. My victory is in him. He overcame the word. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome. And you know what you can do? The same thing that he done, overcome. But God has a way he wants to teach us. And most people hate the teachings of God the way he educates. They don't like his educational process. They really don't. But God is in the business of educating us, not in the world thing. You know, he's not trying to educate me in the crypto coin. I need to know more about him. Now, no, don't get me wrong. I'm not preaching against crypto coins or none of that. You know, I almost got in it. My friend called me early, and it sounded real good. And he said, man, he, he was making all kind of big bucks, man. But I have this check system in me. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, I have to be careful because sometimes I can overthink things and, and, and end up, Real bad, but I, here in my last few years, the only thing that matters to me more than anything else in this world is peace. The older I get, the more peace I want. And I, not just any peace. I'm not talking about a piece of pie. I'm talking about God's peace. And every time I went to go to do a little something with that, I could not get no peace. So my friend said, well, man, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get 500 for you and start your account for you. I wouldn't even let him do that. Now, would you believe, I happened to pick my smartphone up the other day, and that very thing I was about to get into, they busted And that would have went my $500. It would have been his, but 
But I just couldn't do it. I couldn't. How many of y'all just, you don't know what to do, so you just do? How many of y'all have that idea? You know, I, I, I know I got to do something. Who told you that? God will never push you. His job is to lead you. And anytime you get up with the idea, boy, boy, I got to do something. I got to do something. You need to sit still. Be still. And know that he is God. God will never push you in anything. He leads you. And he will never lead you in turmoil because he is a God of peace. His way is peace. And so he's going to lead you into a place of peace. But he says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. I hate that. That is not the kind of love I've seen in Hollywood. That's not the kind of love I see in the movies. And he said, when he started loving you, he chastened you. That word chasing me, he uh, educates you. See, I, you know, I, when I went to school, there's a lot of smart kids. And uh, very smart. Educated, well, I won't say educated. Well, yeah, educated, smart. But they lack in so many other areas, like common sense. They couldn't put a worm on a hook. Uh, they didn't know how to pick beans or cotton. But they're very smart. But see, God gives you a rounded education. Okay. Because see, we like this. How many of y'all, when y'all do good, y'all want good? No? You don't? You don't care? You're just going to do good no matter what, right? Right? I ain't going to even ask y'all to lie like that. I would not ask y'all to lie because I see right now you, you kind of stuck between a brick and a hard place. You know that right answer. But you know the answer that's right that you want to give ain't the right answer for you. You realize that, yeah. <laughs> that's why someone said the other day, man, I, man I, I've been doing good. And, and, and look, what, look what done happened. I've been doing good. all. I've been doing so much better. Do you think that's all God wants is for you to do a little bit better? Because sometimes we like to reward ourselves because we, we just like maybe one step beyond where we were last year. But, and so we won't see some kind of reward. But see, the knowing God, he ain't just trying to make you better. You can be doing better and still be defeated. You, you can do better and still be worrying yourself to death, but you're doing better. Then you'll say, well, I ain't worrying as, I don't worry as much as I used to. I hope you said you don't worry at all. A little bit of worry is what? Just as much as a whole lot of worry. But we got this idea in our mind is that somehow if I could just do a little bit better, then I got to get a reward for that. But God says, no, I chasten them that I love. I got to educate you. I'm not in this to just make you a little bit better. Because sometimes all our testimony has been is that we just changed addresses. But we're the same people. Sometimes all we've done is, is change the fellowship, but we're still the same people. So the Lord educates those that he considers to be a son. Because you want your son to be like you. You want your son to act like you. Man, I had one of the greatest comments this week. They said, man, my son from New York, said, boy, they said, he just like you. I said, 
I made me feel real proud. Because God says, I want to be able to say, well, people to say the same thing about my people. You look and act just like your daddy. Wouldn't that be a great compliment to you? You, you, act, you act like Jesus. But instead, they don't get Jesus. They get us. And they got people thinking that Jesus is like them. So he says, look, I'm going to educate you, though. He said, beloved. Everybody said, beloved. beloved. Say, that's me. Say, that's me. Is that y'all? Beloved. Say, that's me. Oh, I love it when he says it. He ain't saying, I'm, I'm going to be loving. He said, beloved. In other words, I've already loved you. I, I ain't trying to love you. I've already loved you. And so he's talking to the people who recognize that they have already been loved and is still being loved. This Bible, these great promises of God, we need to realize who we are. We have been accepted in the beloved. And then he got a message to the beloved. Beloved, think it not strange. This ain't to everybody. Because everybody don't realize, haven't realized they are in the beloved and are the beloved. But you that are beloved, he have a word for you. Don't think it's strange. Concerning. The fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. When you be loved. Now, this is not, everybody ain't trying to be the beloved. Everybody's not trying to be the highly favored of God. But if you are the beloved of God, you should never think it's strange. Concerning the fiery trials, which is to come upon you, come on you like that. He said, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. It's not strange for those who have been chosen. It's not a strange thing for fiery trials to be in your life. It's not a strange thing for you to have a test in God. Why does a people of God still cry at every test that come their way? Man, you all pray for me. Pray that I'll make it. Please. Rejoice in everything, give thanks. You got to be glad in God. Oh, God would have never allowed it to come if He didn't know how to handle it in your life. He hasn't allowed nothing to come your way that caught Him by surprise. And so He deals with every person that comes into the kingdom, He deals with you. Your trial will not be mine. And you better hope mine ain't yours. <laughs> they told that story a long time ago back over on uh, Church Street where he was talking about the guy prayed to the Lord and cried to him and said, Lord, my cross is so heavy. Can I change cross? So the Lord took him to the crossroom. Because this is a story. For well, y'all say, is it Bible? No, it's not. But the Lord took him to the crossroom. And where all the crosses lined up. So for him to choose another cross. When he got in there, because he seen that great big one, he said, no, I know that's not mine. But at the, at the end of the day, he ended up picking up the same cross. It was the smallest cross in the room. How many of y'all believe your problem is bigger than everybody else's? <laughs> you know, so I wish God could pull back the scales and allow you to see exactly what your problem is. Some of y'all will be amazed. Some of y'all crying about the little thing you're going through now and, and think it's big. 
That man, he gave him that cross. He picked the smallest cross that was in the room. He walked out. He said, well, thank you, Lord, for this little small cross. That's when you bought in. Isn't it strange how we think our troubles is bigger than everybody else? There ain't nobody going through what I'm doing. And you didn't know you had a God that called you beloved. You didn't know you had a God that already had set you up. Knowing that there was nothing outside of you that can stop the power that he put inside of you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And yet we're crying. I'm telling you it's time for us to rejoice and again, I say rejoice. Why? Because I am not trying to get a victory. I know where victory is. Oh, hallelujah. See, he deals with every person coming to this kingdom. He told them in Deuteronomy, he said, For the Lord your God is a God of gods. He's a Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not person, nor take it, Rewards. Now, wait a minute. You mean tell me we don't have no people trying to bribe God or nothing? See, some people be trying to bribe him into blessings. Uh oh, here we go. Lord, if you just come through for me this time, I promise you, next week, I'm going to do sit and sit. I'm going to. I'm going to fast for 21 days. God is not at the reward for his goodness. And sometimes we think we can bribe God with tears. You can cry a flood. But you're not going to bribe God with that. Because the Bible said there was a man named Esau. He sought repentance with tears. He sought a place to repent with tears, but never found it. He, God is not bribed by how, how much I cry. He's not going to be moved because I cried for that instant trying to get him to do something. I know that when he gets through doing it, I'm going to go back anyway. We can't buy him with our money. If it was a price to buy God, we wouldn't have enough. You know, you can't cut a deal with him for a lighter sentence. Yes, you have already been judged. When you came to Jesus, you were judged and you were sentenced. Uh-oh. Y'all look surprised. Yeah. Some of y'all were waiting for judgment day to come. Judgment day came when you met him. You were sentenced. You were judged guilty. You was already guilty. And the penalty for your guilt was death. And Jesus stepped up and sentenced you to life. Oh, here we go. And some of y'all didn't realize y'all have been sentenced to life. You've been sentenced to a life of love. Oh, there they go talking about that love. Yeah, that's the sentence of it. Yeah, you've been sentenced to life, a life of love. You've been sentenced to a life of righteousness. You've been sentenced to a life of peace. That was his sentence to you. The reason why you're having problems because you're trying to fight against the sentence. Some of y'all want to be paroled out. <laughs> Let me get out of this, Lord, on good behavior. <laughs> I've been good. 
Don't sentence me to life. Sentence me to death. Because most people would rather die than live. Because Jesus already told you, I come that you might have life. And not only that, abundance of it. And you come and say, no, don't give me that. Give me death. You'd rather live in misery, sadness, chaos, than to take the sentence of life from Jesus. Are you telling me you don't like his judgment? He was right. My God, I wish when I was a kid, when I went before the judge, I wish he would have told me some good things. He wasn't telling me, like Brother Craig, he was telling me stuff like, you're going to get two to seven. Now, I didn't take that too kindly. Some of you would rather be in jail for the rest of your life than to come out free today. Most of you would rather not take the sentence that Jesus had put on you, the sentence of life. It's time to live. No, no, I'm not talking about the old man. The new man is in you. It's time for him to live. Praise God. And sometimes is that we, we, we miss when, when God begins to earmark you for greatness. And most people want to claim greatness before being great. The first thing you need to know who is great, the greatest of them all. And, and, and then you must expect some great trials. We want to be great without any substance. Never been pressed, never been through it, but we want to have our name in lights. Be great. No, because every great man of God in this Bible seemed to have always faced the greater trial. Some of these guys I wouldn't dare want to be. I really don't want to be any of them. Be honest with you, I'm glad God called me Kelly Wilson. I'm glad to be me. I'm enough trouble by myself without wanting to be anybody else. <laughs> I don't desire to be nobody but me. That's all. Because being anybody else, I got, I was just telling my kids the other day, I said, man, everybody talking about how rich they want to be? I said, let me ask you a question. Do you know what come with that? A lot of things come with that. I just want to be rich. I don't want to be just rich. Be careful. There's a whole lot of pains come with a lot of stuff that you're asking for. That's even why God has been so instrumental and in not allowing it to happen because if he did, it would only hurt you. You sometimes think you need what you don't really need. You need more Jesus than you need anything. And so great faith is born out of great trial. You can't believe God any greater than the last trial you had that you came through. But in order for God to build faith in you, he has to take you from faith to faith. If he done that for you in that, then your faith will grow to the next one to meet your next trial. Some of us still eating cookies and drinking Kool-Aid. And sitting in the short seats. It's time to pull up a chair to the table and realize that no, I don't need that baby faith. Now I need more faith because God has brought me through more things. I've seen God operate in more ways than I ever dreamed that God could ever operate in. God is bigger than all of my troubles, all of my trials. He's bigger than all of my sickness. God is so great to us that we ought to always be willing to give him thanks in everything. Oh, hallelujah. You see, I recall when the king of Assyria, uh, Hezekiah, and he came down, the, uh, the Assyrians came down and got around the city. And, uh, you know, 
I, I learned that really in our life, our memory either hurts us or helps us. If you have bad memories, bad memories can mess up today. And all you need to do is someone remind you of something yesterday can almost steal your faith today. So when the Syrians surrounded that city, besieged it and all that, the Assyrians began to cry out and talk to them. Well, you know what we did to you last time. You know what we've done to your neighbors and the other neighbors. And you remember all that? And you get to looking back thinking, yeah, you know, boy, so-and-so. Oh, man, they had cancer and died. And they say, you know, they get in your crawl space. Oh, they had a stroke. Uh, you remember what I done, what happened there? And, 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 and all of a sudden, they get talking to you, and you begin to believe that negative report and begin to kind of wonder, can it happen to me because it happened to them? And, and we use a lot of our memory to wipe out faith for the day. Because they remind you, you do have an adversary, and your biggest one is you because you remember too much. That's why the Bible says, forgetting those things which are behind. But most of us who have not forgotten the things which are behind are struggling now with having faith today. And that Assyrian had besieged them. And they went through all the things that Christian people go through. They fasted, they prayed, and from their fasting and praying, they had weakened themselves so that they couldn't do anything. But you see, they got a God. He wants to erase the past and give you a present because he is a now is God. Now is faith, not going to be. He is a God that is. Give me a couple more minutes. I'm not sure what time it is, but I'm just having too much fun right now. And so here, they all are kind of like outnumbered, outgunned. Everything's against them. You ever feel like that? Everything's against them. You know, I go to the Burger King, no son get to the window, they run out of burgers. You see, but in first King, second King nineteen and three said, and they said to him that says, or thus said Hezekiah, this day is a day of trouble. This is a day of trouble. Man, he said, and and uh, and a rebuke and blasphemy for the children are come to birth and there is not strength to bring forth. See, sometimes it's hard for us to see the ability of God because we are weighing God's ability based upon how strong we feel. And see, when I feel weak, I ain't gonna lie to you though. See, when I feel weak, I know he is strong, but man, sometimes I just make him be as weak as me. Now, tell the truth. Now, now, now see, y'all say, yeah, yeah, you do. Because when you get weak, you think God is weak. If you didn't thought God was weak, you wouldn't be talking weak. If you thought God was as strong as you thought he was as strong as he is, you would not be talking about how bad you are. You'd be talking about how great he is. Yeah, I'm surrounded, I'm besieged on every side, I'm numbered, I'm gone. But God is still on the throne. And when you begin to see God still sitting on the throne, then you won't be talking about how weak you are because when you are weak, then God needs to weaken us because his strength is made perfect in my weakness. I don't want God to be as weak as me. I don't want to serve a God that's weak as me. I don't want to pray to a God that's weak as me. 
I want to pray to a God that has all power in his hand, knowing that he has all the strength I need. I want to pray to a God that's greater than I am. Oh, hallelujah. You see, sometimes it's hard to see the ability of God, especially when you've been faced with so much defeat and seeing it on every side. And it looked like the devil always magnified the defeat more than victory. Of what you, he'd be smart, right? He, he would be smart. He would always want to magnify the defeats. You ought to let him magnify the defeat he thought he had. I would tell the devil, you remember when you had Jesus? <laughs> How you had to beat all up and all that stuff and crowned with thorns and, and speared in the side and hung on a cross and all that. You know, magnify this with me, would you please? <laughs> Yeah, they took him down, put him in the ground, and three days later, guess what happened? Defeat rose up in, in victory. And here, you're letting him show you nothing but the first three days of your life. He only seen your death and burial, but you haven't seen your resurrection. It's when you begin to see your resurrection with his resurrection, then you know that ain't nothing on earth can keep you down or keep you under. That because God said, I, because I have overcome, so shall you. He wants you to keep looking at what's never going to get up. He wants to remind you of stuff that's already dead. You need to remind your enemy, remind yourself, I have risen with him. I sit together with him in heavenly places. Oh, hallelujah. See, one blast from God will change the whole situation. One blow from him. One word. One second. One thing can be changed just in an instant. I don't care what you said the devil done to others. All I'm concerned about is what I know Jesus has done for me. Uh-oh. And, and you know, that's the real problem. We don't know what he done for. And we're still crying about what we think the devil done to us. He ain't done no more to you than he done to Jesus. But I can tell you this here, he didn't stop him. If it didn't stop him, why is it stopping you? Don't get sidetracked. Don't get distracted. Oh, hallelujah. You see, the, when we begin to walk with God, we walk through valleys. Guess who already been through that valley? Huh? You know who already been through the valley you're talking about you're going through? Huh? Bible say he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. But guess what happened when he was walking through it? He came out on the other side. You know why? You're not walking through a valley God ain't walked through. The Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. The valley I walked through, the valley you walked through, if you made him your shepherd, guess who's walking through the valley with you? He's already conquered your valley he's already been through your valley and you're telling me your valley you can't make it I don't believe that we need to make the Lord our shepherd oh hallelujah so many people today are angry with God so upset we also feel the Lord didn't treat them right they claimed all the promises in the book while not knowing that God had a process. Uh -oh. They didn't realize that. They grabbed scriptures, Daniels and every place else, and they claimed those promises, but they didn't claim the process. You don't get there before something prior to that happens. 
You have to be positioned to possess. You got to know that where you are, position, then maybe you can claim what you're claiming. But some of us, it's not even in the process. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sowing, shall reap the same. I'm riding, I'm getting ready to close. But I was riding up through the country this morning. And I looked at those fields and noticed that the cornfield had corn in it. And the soybean field had soybeans in it. Do you think that was an accident? You, you think just by chance? All the corn fell out there in the field, rolled up. No. I believe that corn that was in those fields and saw it being, somebody purposely put it there. But as I was riding this morning, I realized the Lord began to speak to me. He said, you know, the ground is neutral. The ground is neutral. It, it don't discriminate against any seeds. If a seed fall into it, under right conditions, it's going to grow. It's the same thing with us. Until you realize that you are purposely put here, you gonna probably allow all kind of seeds to fall into the ground and grow in your garden that shouldn't be there. Seeds of doubt. I'm not preaching this as gospel or as a law. You know, I haven't looked at the news in a long time. You know why? It started planting seeds in me. And those seeds were changing my attitude. I know some of you don't say, man, oh, it don't matter. But if it messes with the purpose product, it matters. God ain't trying to grow anger in your life. He ain't trying to grow hatred in your life. It does matter what we plant in the garden. We need to be very careful what seeds we entertain in our life. Because then, when the seed grows after a while, the plants is going to produce fruit. Any of y'all ever woke up one day and was surprised the fruit you had? <laughs> You got up mad, mad, ready to kill somebody. You didn't know you planted it there. I believe today, you see, there's not one soul that have received anything from God that didn't really pay the price, but really won the price. You don't get blessed. Just accidentally. The blessings of God are not accidentally. They're purposely given for his purpose. You, you, you're not here by accident. And sometimes the blessings of God can be so painful. It ain't always laughing, laughing. Man, David got, he was doing good today. Put the oil on it. He done real good till they put oil on him. Put oil on him, and you would have thought that he'd have just slid through life. But boy, life got rough after that anointing. All of a sudden, phew, his brothers hated him. He got to fight bears and lions, giants, and everything else. So 
You're thinking here today. Here we are, some of us like Job. And we're thinking, Lord, why me? But then there was another part of Job's life that some people get, don't get into. Because everybody want to stop at where the troubles is. I, I, we're going to have those, but that's not where I want to stop. I want to stop where the victory is. I want to stop where the reward. Say, I can't reward him. But I can come to him and know that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I wonder if today can we say in our heart, man, I just thank God. For the, what I thought was troubles. Man, that wasn't enough trouble. Your troubles never outweigh the rewards that he gave you at the end of it. Never. Man, I, I could even tell you some things blow your mind, but it never outweighs the reward of God. Because he said after you have suffered a little while, just a little while, that's all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to establish you there. Come on, stand with me. God, I thank you today. I thank you because of your greatness that more and more I begin to realize in our lives is you are so great. I thank you, dear God, knowing that you are exalted above all things. Keep a praise in our heart with purpose. Teach us, dear God, your ways. Chasten us, Lord, because you love us. I want to give you all the praise and glory because I'll do that. I thank you, Lord, for your life sentence you have on my life. I've been sentenced to life. Thank you, Lord. And I praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And if you hear it, the last word I heard from God today, cast all your cares upon him. I don't care what it is, but let me just say this here. When you do cast all your cares on him, do not pick them back up. Don't go pick them back up. If you're going to cast your cares today, I don't care what you're fearing, what's got you. I want you to cast all that on Jesus today. I don't have enough, Lord. Cast your, your not enough on him. <laughs> cast all your sadness upon him right now. Because God wants you to cast all your cares. He don't need you worrying about nothing. Worrying, you'll never worship. But if you can cast all your cares so that you can be what God is looking for, he seek those who worship him in spirit and truth. Cast your cares so you can worship, so you don't have to worry. Lord God, I thank you and I praise you for what you've already done. Lord, and sanctify your word in our heart and confirm it in our souls today. In Jesus' name, amen.